From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, busing, constructive or divisive. Over the years, the word busing has come to stand for much that is disturbing to American communities. In some areas, court-ordered school busing, which began as a well-meaning method of desegregating schools, has turned sour. Both blacks and whites in many communities now feel that busing is not the answer. But what is? Are there viable alternatives to busing, which would desegregate classrooms? What has busing done to the quality of education? Has busing, as its inventors had hoped, actually broken down race barriers. Welcome to another roundtable discussion presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Our topic for discussion is busing, constructive or divisive. Four experts in the field will grapple with that subject. Nathan Glazer, professor of education and sociology at Harvard University, he has written extensively about ethnic groups and social problems in America. Robert L. Green, Dean of the College of Urban Development, Michigan State University. Dean Green is an expert on public school desegregation. He is the chief consultant on education to the staff of the NAACP. Charles Morgan, Jr., National Legislative Director, American Civil Liberties Union. Mr. Morgan, an attorney, has been an activist in civil rights and civil liberties cases for many years. Orlando Patterson, Professor of Sociology, Harvard University. Professor Patterson holds a doctorate in sociology from the London School of Economics. He has authored many books and articles on black history. Moderating our discussion will be Virginia Trotter, Assistant Secretary for Education at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Dr. Trotter spent nearly 25 years on the faculty of the University of Nebraska, rising to the position of Vice Chancellor. Now, here is Dr. Trotter. Thank you, Peter Hackett. Welcome to another program in the series of Public Policy Forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute. We are pleased you could join us for what we expect to be an informative and provocative discussion of controversial public policy issue, that is, school busing. The argument surrounding this topic has not arisen because of any dangers or difficulties caused by bus transportation per se in terms of the students. It has often arisen and does arise because of what busing represents, and that is the desegregation of the public schools by forces beyond the direct control of parents. The conflict between the obligation of the courts to eliminate segregation and the desires of the parents to control the institutions and the social forces affecting their children is a topic of our discussion here today. To illuminate the questions before our panel, is busing constructive or is it divisive? Let us first turn to Robert L. Green. Dr. Green, I'd like to know, is busing productive or counterproductive in terms of educational quality? I think there's a body of data to support the point of view that busing uh, can be productive and supportive of a high degree of educational quality. I think also we should, we should be very clear and point out that although 20 million American children are bused uh, annually, uh, a very small minority, less than 4%, uh, are bus for the purposes of racial integration, so I think we should make that clear. But in the instances and in cases in which there has been uh, school desegregation, in which busing has been a mechanism to facilitate that process, there's a body of data to support the point of view that when parents do not interfere, when community groups are not organized who are opposed to the integration of schools with busing as a, a factor uh, in mind, that school children, given the opportunity to learn, to grow, and develop together, do so with a very minimum of conflict. Uh, what do you think of that, uh, Dr. Grazier? I, mean, I wouldn't disagree with uh, Dr. Green, um, but I would to this extent that uh, I think busing, a term which uh, I find as unpleasant as he does, so what, what I have in mind when I talk about busing is not busing, which is obviously unobjectionable, but involuntary assignment of students to schools on the basis of race. This is what I mean, and this is what I object to. Uh, I think it's on the whole, uh, it, 
it's been irrelevant to issues of education. Uh, it's neither facilitated nor as such, nor uh, made it more difficult. It's been dependent on all sorts of other circumstances. And it has not been instituted to improve education, and it, one wouldn't expect it to. Uh, it's been instituted for other reasons, which I suppose we'll get into. And, um, um, and I think in many circumstances, it's been sufficiently disruptive, uh, combined with other forces, to say, well, it certainly hasn't been a good idea. That, uh, now, Mr. Morgan, uh, is there a difference between the North and the South in terms of the appropriateness of busing as a means of desegregation? I think there is. I don't think there's a Southerner, white or black, who all during the years of the Civil Rights Movement didn't think, just as George Wallace said, that once it got to South Boston and the Souths of the North, uh, the white liberals would retreat. Uh, uh, Dr. Patterson, to what extent do you think the blacks have benefited from uh, school busing? Well, the problem here is um, benefits and what's respect. Um, I think there's part of the confusion lies in the fact that there's little agreement concerning what um, the exact um, goals of busing should be. Uh, to some extent, uh, most people are concerned with the direct educational um, benefit. Uh, increasingly, however, people are asking, um, even assuming that there are educational gains, it uh, seems to me, too, that one has to consider um, benefits in, 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 in social terms. The, um, uh, one could make a good case for busing uh, as a means of increasing the level of communication between the races in the United States. As someone who is a non-American, I find it um, really quite extraordinary that um, <laughs> the races after being together for several centuries in this country, it should, um, there should be such awkwardness, even on the public level, in terms of racial interaction. So there are different kinds of benefits, and quite often these um, benefits uh, conflict, contradict with each other. And one has to be clear which one you have in mind and which you consider the most important. Do well, we have... Let me add, add, in a society where blacks, unlike Jews and other ethnic groups from, you know, with respect to Professor... Uh, uh, Glazer's experience, came to this country as slaves, were subjugated as slaves, were made the subject of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which were not written, even though I've used them, for the rights of women and others, which were written solely for the rights of blacks as an affirmative mandate on government to correct racial inequality and its results. Now, I, I pose that because you've raised you know, certain uh, questions about blacks and whites don't interact and that sort of thing. Does that not take out of the context of ethnic minorities and ethnic group thinking. The whole problem of blacks in America, and is any of the rhetoric we hear with respect to busing that compares the plight of the Jews or the Polish or the uh, Italian Americans, does it apply to blacks at all? I think the other critical point, too, in response to Professor Glazer, much of the desegregation litigation uh, nationally has had as its focus the improve improvement of educational quality. And as a part of that, uh, strategies uh, related to remedy have been sought. And uh, in order to bring young people together for the purposes of racial integration, in order to improve quality, namely one in terms of, uh, of achievement, academic achievement, and secondly, in terms of communication and the breaking down of racial atti attitudes that uh, negatively impact on how young people view each other very early in life and in later life, there has been a very specific focus and uh, busing simply uh, is only a strategy to bring that process about. Uh, yeah. and, and, and I think the, the critics of busing should come up with an alternative. And, and I've discovered that those who are opposed to uh, utilizing busing uh, as a strategy to desegre desegregate American schools have brought forth no other strategy. Terms such as involuntary uh, assignment, terms such as busing, uh, only become prominent in the minds of Americans when race and social class is raised. So I think somewhere along the discussion, we need yeah. to focus, up, focus upon race, race bias, and social class I'm bias, too. I'm glad you too. added the social class the Social issue. class because, bias, as uh, we see it in Boston, until the issues are honestly addressed, then we will focus on matters that are relatively unimportant. We can't ignore that busing in America is widely accepted, widely endorsed, widely approved, and in my state of Michigan, we endorse and support busing to the tune of millions. Mm -hmm. 
but very little is done for the purposes of racial well, integration. Well, I, I think we will address those questions, but I, uh, 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 I was... I wanted to take up just briefly uh, Mr. Morgan's point about the special position of blacks, which I fully agree with, uh, I mean, as you put it. However, how do you deal with the following problem? That uh, once you hit the North or the West, where you have very large minorities aside from black, no water, it seems, can limit itself to blacks. No water can say this happens to be a group with a special legal status in the United States, the status of having been slaves and having had laws addressed against it, and that's all we're concerned with. In other words, we are really, spreading, we are really dealing, to my mind, with a spreading plague in which uh, ethnic and racial categorization uh, is, uh, is more and more fixed on people through governmental action, to the action of courts. Uh, now, admittedly, this is not the reason why South Boston is up in arms. I don't believe that they are a concern about a theoretical constitutional issue. And uh, I would accept that. I must say I am. I am concerned about, uh, about uh, uh, a nation uh, which uh, more and more brings into its law ethnic and racial category for public action. I thought we got rid of that in 64, and I would have Let me hoped to live with it. But admittedly, there is a second issue that we have to get to that Dr. Green is raising. Uh, well, I mean, if, if, if that's not the reason people are up in arms, what are the reasons? I mean, the race and social class issue. Let me, uh, let me go to that just a moment. We talk about busing. I think what you're referring to now is the use of racial statistics, identification. Those kinds of group identifications are individual identifications in our society by government. Am I correct? Yes. Now, when we began in 1879 or 1880, to strike down statutes which excluded blacks from juries. They, uh, the Supreme Court said those statutes are no good. Immediately, white public officials in the South, out of which this problem arises, mm -hmm. white public officials started practicing exclusion and they just left blacks off. Mm -hmm. Over the years, as blacks were convicted, they raised the question of systematic exclusion from juries. They couldn't prove it. They couldn't prove that they were left off for any reason because the white officials came in and they said, we didn't do it for that reason. Now, the way statistics came up was as follows. The courts said, look, if you've got 80% of the population in this county that's black, and no black has ever served on a jury, the burden of proof shifts to the state or to the county, and now they have to prove what, what the uh, reasoning process is. They never could do that. So it became a technique of proof. There's still the assumption in this discussion that busing is, is good, per se, and um, I think one ought to recognize that it's, it, it works in certain circumstances, it doesn't in others. And um, I think even more important, we, um, the dialogue should now uh, reach a point where we begin to specify exactly what this, this thing is about. One has to think, begin to think in cost-benefit terms. Now, there can be no doubt. Let's take, the, let's take the issue of busing as a means of uh, simply creating a more civilized situation uh, between the races, I, which I think is a very valid, is one of the, for me, one of the major um, justifications for busing. Um, uh, does it work? Um, uh, does the, uh, is the cost too great? Now, let's take the Boston situation. I find it extraordinary that uh, blacks, uh, among the most impoverished group in Boston economically and socially, uh, should be bus to <laughs> the most impoverished group among the whites socially, culturally, and economically. Um, what it seems to me would have been a more rational approach would be to, um, to bus uh, blacks, if they're going to be bus, and, 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 um, and to the middle class community. Of course. One of the problems you see to me is that the, the white low classes, who are the most <laughs> impoverished culturally and socially, are being asked to bear the burden of, um, of, of, of busing. And frankly, I can't see what the benefit That's to a black child. That's precisely correct. I, mean, I don't think you're going to get any no, disagreement okay. out of either now, of us on that. Now, the next question is, um, assuming that you um, continuing on this um, business of social um, benefits, um, assuming that you do bus children into a uh, middle class neighborhood, um, uh, is there proof that busing improves um, the, 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 the nature of the relationship between... Um, uh, now, I, I've always assumed that, uh, that, that it does, but um, I've also read um, no. data... Um, <laughs> there is uh, there's 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 some, yeah. there are some civil rights data from 1966 indicating that uh, blacks and whites who attend integrated multiracial classrooms very early in life are more likely 
uh, and, and are more willing to uh, select friends from the opposite perceived racial cultural group as adults. I think uh, we're at the point now where we have a very unique opportunity to collect data in a wide range of school districts, north, south, east, and west, looking at not only race, but social class as well, in terms of attitudinal change over time. The difficulty that social scientists very often encounter, unlike their natural science counterpart, is the fact that very often data surrounding school desegregation must be collected in a very tense, yeah. highly conflictual situation. And so the collect uh, collection of data related to assessing attitudes often is very difficult. But uh, looking at it from another standpoint, there is a body of data that supports the point of view in several school districts from California to Michigan that the desegregation of schools does improve in, educational yeah, quality, right. and I think that's another cost benefit. Under what circumstances, benefit. though? Yes. It's, you know, I recall, for example, uh, the New York private schools in the early 60s were all concerned about having black children. They would give out scholarships here and there. And Everybody most, wants one. Yeah, well, uh, they got up to two, three, ten, yes. and so on. And uh, it, it was great, you know, fine. Uh, you know, whites met blacks and blacks met whites and uh, some of these kids maybe had better opportunities for getting onto colleges and so on. Metco uh, in Boston, you know, we talk about uh, the Boston thing, and uh, it has been in existence now for, oh, uh, seven, eight years, I suppose. And about, I think, what is the figure, the 1,500 or 2,500 black kids go to suburban schools. They go voluntarily uh, because uh, they want to go or their parents want them to go. The, the uh, school, the communities they go to uh, accept them or are happy to have them. And as a matter of fact, uh, because uh, something I think uh, maybe you'll agree with me, because education research is so difficult, I must say in that circumstance, I don't care what the educational research shows. It's very complicated and disputed. Uh, on the other hand, when, uh, my, first of all, my guess is when it's done on a voluntary basis, it has to work out. I mean, whatever temporary negative or other effects there are. And because educational research is so ambiguous, as I say here, even though I'm a professor, I overrule it and say, that's a good thing. But in other cases, and cases particularly where there is, uh, uh, and I know we get to our constitutional issue, great resistance, where people say, I don't like it, I don't want it, nothing's going to happen as a result of it, and I didn't do it. All right, then That's what very is, important. All right, but what is then the proper it's role? not going to work out very okay. well. Well, I think, too, okay. when we speak about voluntary transfers, freedom of choice, voluntary desegregation, the burden is very typically put upon uh, the limited minority, the small minority, who are always at a disadvantage. And, we, and, and I, I don't think we can talk about 2,500 uh, youngsters in an experimental <laughs> program in Boston black children being yeah. bused out to uh, upper-class white schools. I think we need to talk about the quarter of a million in Detroit, the vast numbers in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and so forth. And also, 2,500 youngsters typically have, on a voluntary basis, have no impact on national public policy in the area of education. You also take a situation where there is no history of legal segregation of the races. And you take a situation where people are not aware that anybody's doing anything to them. The whites are not particularly aware that uh, anyone's helping them keep out the blacks. I'm giving a, maybe Boston might be a little different, but, and the blacks, uh, at least be, uh, I don't know what they're that aware of. That means you're telling me more than one of Let me just yeah, finish the story in a sentence. <laughs> the, the fact is, it is a much more mixed situation. When you talk about Selma, I think you're talking about the situation of the acknowledgement of injustice, a radical effort in the case of Selma to keep blacks from voting. There is no radical effort to keep blacks from voting in Boston. I think there never has been. Or if there has, it's so long ago nobody remembers when it was. Voting is on. But I mean, I'm talking about the Selma case. Yeah. Okay. And, and, if you, and if it means violence to, uh, to give rights to blacks to vote or to break down the legal segregation of the races, then you need violence. But what, are you, but what is the violence in Boston for? But, 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 but you must remember that uh, efforts must be, it must be made to control violence at every level, uh, irrespective of who, uh, who are, uh, who's involved in perpetuating violence. I think the de facto, de jure argument that's being questioned, that's being raised now, is basically an artific artificial one. It doesn't matter uh, that schools in Selma and other parts of the South were segregated by law. We find that the behaviors and policies 
of officials in cities like Detroit and states like Michigan, states such as Illinois, bring about the same result. And when the argument is made that uh, parents, white parents in Boston are not aware of the fact that there is a systematic effort to, de to, deny, to, to deny blacks due process, then they're not very literate and they're not reading because realtors, bankers, all engage in a process to make sure that blacks yet live today in racially segregated the residential districts. And they need not hang out signs anymore saying no blacks want it. There was a CBS special, NBC special one, a very short time ago, looking at redlining. And the systematic effort, even yet today, uh, to maintain blacks irrespective of income. And, and I read a piece of yours in which you stated that uh, income determines where blacks live. Sir, there's a tremendous body of data, part of which I have access to and would be willing to share with you, indicating that not income nor education, but race and ethnicity are the most volatile factors in determining where blacks live in the United States well, of America. I think the argument on that is that income certainly determines in part, and the question is how big the part is. Well, you see, and we can and, argue uh, over one or the other. We can say it's income or jobs, as Professor Patterson said, or it's something else, or it's housing, or it's this or that. Whatever it is, doesn't much matter. You just start and you go, and it works out, or it doesn't. You take, if somebody wants to work in jobs, that's fine with me. Want to work in housing, fine. But I think I hear what I refer to and have for years as Albert Schweitzer liberalism. Now, I grew up around that sort of thing. It's send your old clothes and Albert Schweitzer to Africa and worry about the poor starving Chinese. I have gained more pounds worrying about the poor starving Chinese in later life than anything else. I know Selma is the poor starving Chinese to the folks at Harvard. Well, and I know the same thing exists all across this country. And I, I think this is especially well, true I because... Make, uh, I would well, still make a, a radical yeah. distinction. Uh, well, yeah, I, but we're, we're all talking about uh, uh, the social issues that are involved in terms of, rate of, of the problems that we're facing. But really, I, what I'd like to ask us to do is get back to the point of really what is busing doing to us? Is it divisive or is it constructive? Busing, or, uh, busing is a is neutral necessary? construct. All right. People are divisive. Uh, policies that are not enforced are divisive. Uh, individuals who misunderstand others and motivation of others. Blacks and whites in South Boston and Roxbury who do not understand the fact that their welfare rate is the same. That the high school dropout rate in South Boston is equally as high as it is in Roxbury. That during one specific month in the latter part of last year, the wealth, welfare rate in South Boston was slightly higher than the welfare rate in Roxbury. Blacks and whites have to understand that their plight is a common one. So but, bus, they busing, but it seems busing, to me, I mean, on that issue, that um, the, the only thing uh, that busing has done is to uh, make them aware of... Uh, busing hasn't uh, done uh, that. Divided busing them, hasn't um, done that. And busing is a strategy, solidarity. hopefully, that will lead to uh -huh. a re-education and the kind of learning process that you refer to, which well, will lead to... Integration, by the nature of the word, brings people together. Busing and all sorts of things, like integration, make some white folks very mad. When it makes them mad, then they say it's divisive. The fact is, it just makes them mad. Well, I'm, I, I think it's divisive among, I mean, I'm may sorry. I suggest it's divisive among blacks, too. I testified in the suit uh, that's just been completed in Cleveland, uh, the judge has not given down his order, uh, on the um, uh, school integration issue. He's trying to find out if there's segregation. And, uh, uh, it, uh, <laughs> we can't look and see. <laughs> well, uh, no, he's trying to find out if it's segregation caused by uh, actions of the school committee. The school board is headed by a black man, Arnold Pinckney. He's run for mayor twice, lost, second time came closer the first time. Been a black mayor in uh, Cleveland before that, Carl Stokes. The, uh, I looked at talking about divisive, and I looked at the two boards, you know, the two tables, uh, the defense, uh, the plaintiffs, and the defense. Plaintiff's table was headed by uh, Nat Jones, uh, NAACP, uh, my friend Tom Atkins from uh, Boston. Uh, what should I say, a bunch of outsiders, black and white, uh, would undoubtedly have some community support arguing this case before a judge. The defense table, headed by a white lawyer, a uh, local Cleveland lawyer, second in command, a black Cleveland lawyer, uh, a white uh, chairman of the board, uh, I mean, a superintendent. Arnold Pinckney comes down, black uh, school officials, and so on. Their feeling is, uh, I mean, I don't think it's the greatest thing in the world. The way things have developed in Cleveland, and I don't think it's all uh, real estate. It's, uh, 
uh, you know, it's the way things have developed. Uh, they're, uh, that's right. It's, it's sort of natural. That's right. Black and black folks that's right. find uh -huh. each other. No, blacks uh, start, came into Cleveland on the east side of town and moved east. There's a very long history of uh, the expansion of areas. Uh, the, the east side and is divided by a substantial canyon. The Cuyahoga River has turned into, has gotten mostly black. The west side has gotten, uh, stays white. The east side, as blacks move up in the world, has middle class black sections, where schools are middle class schools. And, and they say, you know, what's going on here? Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, what's going on here is that somebody has decided that half the people in the west side ought to be bust to the east side, and half the people in the east side ought to be bust to the west side. And, they, and the people of Cleveland, as far as I can see, an awful lot of the people of Cleveland don't see any purpose to this I know, it was like because things were seen the same way in the South. I mean, when blacks in department stores in the South couldn't try clothing on, uh, and black women had to purchase a dress, and, and they, oh. if they took it home and it didn't fit, they couldn't return it. When blacks and whites rode separate elevators up in, in the department stores in the South, everyone stated that uh, when the NAACP, C, NAACP began to file suit, when Martin Luther King Jr. began to lead demonstrations, people were asking the same question that you're asking well, about the radical enough. difference well, there. One group the, the, was held subordinate to the other. But, well, but you uh, see, but, I'm trying to give you an example. But there are radical differences in Cleveland in terms but the of Harvard reading. scores, in terms of academic <laughs> achievement, and also, the radical difference is this. Probably not my colleagues not at Harvard, class levels, when we were looking at the South, my colleagues at Harvard, at Stanford, at Harvard, not Harvard, Harvard. My colleagues at Harvard, Stanford, and the leading Eastern institutions willingly joined me in examining school desegregation policies in Prince Edward County, Virginia, when I engaged in my search. research. Now that we're looking at northern urban institutions, now that we're looking at home, my, the, many of the same colleagues, and I include, include many of friends we know very well, are beginning to draw a very unfair comparison. And the comparison is essentially the same. If, if the long-term object, if the ultimate objective is to reduce inequality, I say busing is not the best way to go about it. Uh, not what, because, what, what, no, what it's not. Nobody ever said what about the best what way. Is, what no, I'm option. saying is it does. It, and you're talking about if it, what option, finish. and as a historian, let, let, give me some historical me evidence uh, there to, is a negative, to document the option. Wait a minute. There's a negative effect in the sense that I think it's obscuring the basic issues. That is, a great deal of uh, the energies of black leaders and liberals who should be their supporters have been directed on this issue when it should be directed on other issues. Now, Name what one. are these other positive Name issues? One. A growing concern with the problem of, of, of the increasing, not the decreasing, um, a unemployment situation. We're working on that. Youth. We're working on that. We're not. I, I there's mean, in a fact, major there's, there's full too much work in terms of the allocation of, if you want to like, leadership energies. I can give you well, evidence I, that it's but, being done. But there's no impact. The, I mean, well, there's no impact of in young the area of school desegregation of, either. Um, young ethnics all over the country, as a matter of fact, is, is, is increasing. <laughs> and, the reason, the reason we're all here is that we got to go to school and got an education. That's the reason you teach at Harvard. That's the reason that Dr. Glazer And it makes a difference no, in your outcome, too. It happens that education no, that, is a weapon. I don't believe it's an end in itself an or it's weapon. an answer. I don't think it's an effective weapon. I don't think it's an effective weapon. Well, it is. It, it most certainly is. It's here. been a very good one from you, sir. Yes, but what's the other side of the table? It's been a very good one from you, and there are only a few like you at Harvard University. But you're committing that, you know, reductionist. There's only a very few like yourself at Harvard. But you're committing a reductionist fallacy here. The fact that... I mean, what's true of uh, myself? Uh, I mean, I happen to be one of the lucky few who, in a sense, are because of education. Yes, but that doesn't mean that everyone can. And because, because of the a structure quarter, of I inequality may be such that while several can make it, at any given time, I mean, a substantial number of people will have to be losers. I would like to get back to the uh, educational issue in a way. And uh, uh, Dr. Green says something which is uh, very potent. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I had spoken of Metco and, uh, uh, you know, the 2,500 he chews. He says, well, that's nothing. Now, I, I think a lot of us uh, don't realize uh, how much voluntariness can do. And uh, here I'd like to make this plug. That 2,500 happens to be 10% of all the black students in Boston. There are only about 25,000 in Boston, 25,000, 28,000. That's 10% who voluntarily choose some other school. And uh, the, the others who are left behind, even beside the busing today, uh, an awful lot were already going to integrated schools. I don't know, 20, 30 percent were integrated enough for them. And uh, I'm not suggesting that the 2,500 who chose the well, suburban schools were choosing, choosing it all because there were whites there. They were choosing it because they were better schools. Uh, 
There is, uh, we have had, uh, uh, I have seen evidence that if you have voluntary programs, and admittedly we haven't had them for places as big as Detroit, and that might be an interesting problem, but we can just start out and try it out. On voluntary program, you get 20 or 30 percent will choose to accept, I'm talking now the black side, will choose to accept uh, this burden, yes, busing and so on, but a lot of people choose. A lot of people choose because of a better school. Catholics decide they want to go to a Catholic school and they're going to get on a bus, and uh, people decide they prefer high schools the other end of town. And I think uh, the notion that this is uh, unfair, that people have to do something to get something, there's uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's, uh, let them uh, let them choose. Uh, now, the argument on voluntariness then comes out, and what about all the rest? And here I do want to say something for education. I, uh, I know our evidence isn't, I know our experience isn't very good, but I just don't believe that that black school, and even admitting the fact that a lot of kids have chosen something else, is a, an impossible school. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's an impossible school today, and maybe haven't figured out how to make it a better school. But I simply do not believe that, uh, that there is uh, something absolutely organic and essential in black culture or anything else that means that a, a majority black school, not imposed by law, but existing, but that's where people live and they go to school, you know is going to have to be a lousy a school. That. Do you know of any instance in the history of this country, or perhaps any yeah. other, where white folks have put their money into anything their children didn't go to? And do you think black folks would if they had it? And, and I, want, I want Dr. Green to... Uh, and related to that, uh, you're raising the argument of separate but equal. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't and, put and it that way. Well, no, can, no, no, can no. blacks learn together in an all-black setting? I would say yes in all black nations. It can happen in Kenya. Yeah. It can happen in Zaire. But in, as long as we live in a society that is as race conscious and class conscious as this nation is and this society is and this culture at large tends to be, then all black schools will not function adequately in America because forces are established to make sure that they do not function adequately. My last point on volunteerism. It's always been interesting for me to note historically that those who hold power speak of volunteer behavior. That has always been the case. Now the courts did strike down the symbol of school desegregation, but after that, everything taken was taken exactly as you suggest, by moral suasion, by blacks going into the streets, by Rosa Parks refusing to get up on a bus, by Martin King, for whom and with whom Bob worked and on whose board I served in the South. Now, when you look at that kind of moral suasion, which is shot down, then you know you have lost that kind of a leader. But always remember this, the courts and the Congress of the United States merely ratified a movement that took place by individual, nonviolent citizens in this country, and which was ratified by a majority white population and then was ratified by their institutions, the courts and the Congress. Well, yeah, the well, just to uh, conclude this, I'd like to throw out a question is just exactly what do, should we do in terms of public policy as far as uh, integration and the schools are concerned? What is the stand that we should take as far as public policy in the United States if we're going to do the kind of job that we should do with desegregation? And I think that we have addressed a lot of issues, but we, I'd like to conclude with this one. May I go first? Uh, just desegregate across the board in the United States, use as little busing or disruption as possible. Pair schools, use whatever the techniques are, wind up with white and black folks going to school together, both in the ghettos and in the suburbs. The law is pretty clear that we do this as peacefully as we can, but we do it. Uh, do any of you? Uh, well, uh, well, only the position I've uh, asserted before, I'm against, uh, uh, unless uh, uh, there are cases of state action of segregation, which I don't think is primarily the situation in the North. I assert that uh, unequivocally, and I can defend that and have defended that. Uh, segregation in the North or separation is not the result of state action. And if it's not the result of state action, I think the state has no goddamn business getting in there uh, saying you black go there because you're black and you white go there because you're white. Uh, I think it's a great idea for the races to mingle, to know each other, to advance, and I think they ought to, every possible voluntary means should well, be developed to create that. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, one last statement. Brief. I fully support the point of view that uh, American schools should be desegregated along race and class lines. Secondly, I strongly disagree with Professor Glazer's argument that northern states 
have not uh, willingly and collectively participated in actions to bring about segregated public schooling. There is a body of data that's available to support that point of view, and I would be willing to share, with it, share that with him. I have a definitive paper mm -hmm. on northern school desegregation well research, which clearly illustrates the role between county and state officials, as well as city officials, in bringing about the segregation as we know, know it in northern urban communities. I think we should first of all define or begin to define our objectives more clearly, um, specify what the economic as opposed to the purely educational objectives would be. We should then recognize how these, um, uh, the implementation of these objectives will vary from one part of America to another. This is a vast continent. Um, perhaps it impresses me more as someone who grew up in a tiny island, but this is a huge country. It's a highly heterogeneous country. and. Um, uh, the uh, one objective may exist for one situation, may not exist in another, uh, where one may find that in one area. Uh, the social objectives have already been attained, but the economic and educational have not, and so on. One should therefore be very careful to specify what the objectives are for particular areas, and also be more flexible in the means. Always being aware of the costs involved in implementing a program. And what worries me is a certain degree of dogmatism which is involved. Finally, one should also be aware of the fact that this whole issue is, is an exercise in superstructural play, which I think has reached the limits of its potential. That we should, uh, we are running the risk of. Um, of um, uh, uh, diverting energies which perhaps we should start to um, redirect in a more direct way at reducing the structure of inequality in American society. Very good. Thank you very much. It's obvious that all four members of today's panel agree there must be compliance with the constitutional guarantee of equal opportunity in public education. It's also obvious that our panelists differ on whether busing is the way to guarantee that equal educational opportunity. At this point, we call in the experts in our audience to challenge the members of our panel with their questions. We've now concluded the first segment of our program, and uh, the panelists will be open to questions from the experts and members of the press that are here. First question. Thank you. I'm Jim Farr, the National Council for Black Child Development. My question I direct to Dr. Green and open to the panel. Uh, Earlier you spoke of basic facts and data. My question is, do the basic facts, or does do the basic facts, that is, represent that busing does improve education, or do the basic facts and data show that busing only helps bring together racial groups? Typically when that question is posed, we look at two areas. Mm -hmm. One, hardcore academic achievement, improvement in basic skills, reading, ma reading, math, and social studies skills. And secondly, in the attitudinal area. And the limited data that we have available to us on the balance suggests that there is, over time, if youngsters are placed in a desegregated setting for a long period of time, it does have an overall beneficial positive impact on the development of democratic attitudes. There's been some conflict in the area of academic achievement, but I think much of the recent data, data from Berkeley, California, from Pontiac, Michigan, as an example, suggests that white academic achievement does not decline and in some instances does increase, and that black academic achievement uh, uh, typically grows very rapidly and is facilitated by the process of desegregation. That basically is what the facts suggest. There are a number of complicated, complicating factors. And one major complicating factor is essentially this. It's very hard to get good, accurate data in settings that are really flavored with uh, a conflict. And uh, testing black and white youngsters in Boston today would be a very inaccurate measure of a stable attitude. And the measurement of a stable attitude is key in social science research. One might be measuring fear, anger, hostility, and not really an accurate perception of how that youngster views white children, white people at large, or how the white youngster might even view black youngsters at large. So social scientists have not been afforded the luxury uh, of, of that natural science uh, scientists typically have in terms of controlling carefully their experiments. But I think the limited data that we have available to us uh, suggests that on the balance, desegregation is positive and healthy. It sure has been the case 
on the other side of the ledger in the South, because white attitudes towards blacks in southern rural and urban communities have changed dramatically. Even though whites stated that uh, they would strongly be opposed to uh, desegregation in public facilities and that it would bring about a real calamity in the South, once the law was clear, and it was clear that the law would be in force, there was very little difficulty, and there has been a healthy improvement in the attitudes of black towards white and white towards black in southern communities once the law was clear and in force. Part of the difficulty, finally, uh, in a city like Boston, where there's been a tremendous amount of conflict, is that there has been some hesitancy to strongly enforce the law. This coupled with uh, uh, the statement by the president that he himself did not believe in busing undermine the effectiveness of the court order and also undermine the willingness of the public at large to support the law. In other words, law and order is hard to enforce when the public perceives that key powerful, key and powerful political leaders are not supportive of the law. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Donning, and I'm a professor of constitutional law at Howard Law School. I don't represent the law school, but I work there. But um, it seems to me that Dr. Glazer's position that he would agree with the Supreme Court's decision, the majority opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson, about the separate but equal facilities uh, not uh, violating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. But we're also mindful of Brown versus the Board of Education decided in 1954, which said that separate but equal was inherently unequal and violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Also, with respect to his preoccupation, in my opinion, on voluntarism, uh, in the Green case decided in 1968, it said that freedom of choice plans would have to be discarded when they uh, did not, uh, were not instrumental in abolishing uh, segregated schools. Also, in the Swan case decided in 1971, Your question? I, very, very it said that busing was permissible. So my uh, question to Dr. Glazier is, does he think it's up to the individual citizen to determine which laws that they will comply with and which ones they will not? Uh, uh, there are quite a few points there. First, I do not agree with the Supreme Court decision in Plessy versus Ferguson. Nothing I said should have suggested to any person that I'd agreed with the separate but equal decision of Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson upheld state laws separating the races. I attack any kind of law making racial distinctions. Let me make that perfectly clear. Secondly, I support the Brown decision, absolutely, totally, and completely. Thirdly, I support the Green decision, but the Green decision on voluntarism has nothing to do with the situations I am talking about. The voluntarism the Green decision attacked was not a true voluntarism. You had had a black school determined by law and a white school determined by law. And what happened the Green decision is that the county said anyone could go to the school they wanted to, but the blacks were not allowed by violence and intimidation to go to the white school, and the whites didn't go to the black school. That was a fake voluntarism. The voluntarism of the North is not a fake voluntarism. METCO is not a fake voluntarism. The voluntarism that permits free choice in many northern cities is not fake. Blacks, when they choose schools, are not driven out by rocks and stones on the voluntary situations. And their parents are not threatened to not lose their jobs. That's not the case in Hartford. It's not the case in Rochester. It wasn't the case in New York. It isn't the case in the Boston area under the voluntaristic programs. Finally, um, just as I opposed the Plessy versus Ferguson situation, uh, the separate but equal, and would have felt it was perfectly within my rights as a citizen to attack the court's decision on that, and to believe that in time the court would come to its senses and would agree that uh, uh, that, uh, that decision was in error. So I oppose uh, the decision of the court in Keys in Denver. So I oppose the upholding of the decisions in San Francisco and in Pasadena. These are wrong decisions. These take decisions in which a, a partial uh, concentration of the races exists for a variety of reasons and distort that situation into a finding of state segregation. The court is wrong.
There will be new appointments to the court, I hope, and the court will discover it was wrong, just as it discovered it was wrong in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. But my question was, is it up to the individual citizen, Dr. Glazier, to determine which laws or judicial decisions they will comply with and which ones they will not? No, it is or not up states. to the individual decision to determine that, but the individual citizen uh, uh, obeying the law has the right to uh, uh, protest the law, certainly. I think you would agree with that. Has the right to argue with the law while obeying it. Has the right to organize and to present evidence uh, that the law in this case is wrong. And has the right to hope, peacefully, has the right to hope that in time the law will be changed to accord with that citizen's view as what the proper law in that connection is. Very good. Thank you. Uh, next question. Ed O'Connell from Congressman Pryor's office. Dr. Green, in the Detroit situation, with the Milliken case and stating that there is no, no interdistrict remedy in that vow. Is it not the solution on a voluntary basis for cooperation between the suburban districts and the Detroit School District as to integrate those schools? Isn't that the only thing left? No, I, I think there is another option available here. Uh, the court did not definitively rule out the possibility of metropolitan desegregation. What the court stated was essentially this that unless proof can be given that suburban school districts in some way were responsible for segregated policies in urban centers, that desegregation will not be mandated by the courts. So I think the burden of proof yet rests with the plaintiffs or the NAACP in that, in that setting. Then your solution would be to go to the courts in all the major center cities versus the suburban districts? My solution would be to encourage and support METCO and all of the other volunteer approaches. For example, I strongly supported the volunteer desegregation of restaurants in the South. When a store owner had the, 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 uh, the willingness and the foresight to desegregate his store in the South, I supported that. But we also utilize the judicial approach to speed the process up. And I'm saying that in centers around the country, uh, I. I have yet seen the evidence, and I'm yet looking for someone to provide me with evidence that volunteerism has had a, a real impact on policy, educational policy nationally. I'm looking for that evidence. I'm not ruling it out. I support it. But I think the courts, as yet the best, not the worst, as Professor Coleman and Professor Glazer and others have indicated, I don't see the courts as the worst instruments of social change. I see the courts as being relatively cautious, relatively conservative, relatively concerned with collecting data and carefully analyzing that data and reaching good, careful conclusions and recommendations in most cases. Thank you. I'm Valerie Earle, professor of government at Georgetown University. I'd like to address a question to Mr. Morgan and Mr. Glazer. In fact, two questions. I can do it in 45 seconds. You said, Mr. Morgan, that Yikwo was an early example of extension of 14th Amendment equal protection to other than blacks. But the new equal protection, which is, I think, what is concerning Mr. Glazer and me, is a very recent development. That is the one under which many suspect classifications are developing. And I share Mr. Glazer's concern about quotas, quotas, quotas. And I don't find your early history about juries or Yikwo very comforting on this point and would welcome further comment. My second question, uh, again, to be addressed by both, I hope, why is it that one does not move to a vigorous effort against redlining in public policy? Why must school busing or other such means uh, be the uh, instrument of attack upon segregation in residential facilities? Why not legislation on redlining? Why the schools? May I? I'll go first on this one. You go right. first on the other one. Uh, on redlining, to take the last question first, fine. I think we should move against that. I think the courts should move against that. I do not, for instance, see the courts as the be-all and the end-all. I am interested in changing the judges on the courts to make sure that we get even better rulings in this area. But I think we should move there. But I have heard, Dr. Earl, all of my life that we should move in education. We should move in education whenever we're moving on employment. Whenever somebody moves then on employment, uh, then it should be housing. Whenever you move into housing, we should educate first. If we educate first, they'll be able to get jobs. If they get jobs, then they'll be able to live in the housing. If they can live in the housing, they 
It's all some sort of a circle. It's like the Ballantine's beer can. You just take whichever circle it is and you go forward, that's all. Right. Next question. Mr. Morgan, I'm a little concerned about how you would determine in this busing which students would be bused from the ghetto to the middle class neighborhood and which students would be bused from the middle class neighborhood to the ghetto or to the upper class neighborhoods. And in a concern for group or social class equity, I wonder how you handle the question of individual equity. Well, I would take first your group and social class equity. I don't see the, the principal problem is only the exclusion of blacks from the public schools. I think what we've developed in this country is a single and dual and then a quadruple class system of education, whereby in suburbs, white suburbs, we walk around saying 99% of the children at Old Siwash High go to college. Well, 91% of those kids, daddies and mothers went to college. They've grown up that way. They're rich, upper middle class white kids who go from there to Harvard where they set up a quota to bring a few blacks in voluntarily. Now, I would take those kids just like all the rest of them, and we have something called the alphabet, A through Z, and I would say we will use the alphabet here in wonderful little community that we've got over here of the rich white folks, and we use the alphabet over here in the terrible, terrible, terrible old community of the poor black folks. And once those rich white folks kids get in that black folks school, guess what's going to happen? The windows are going to get fixed. The police are going to be in the neighborhood. The school is suddenly going to be a quality school. The film that we're coming out on is going to be shown there. The money is going to come from the Board of Education. And that's what the answer to integration is. White folks ain't going to put their money into anything their children don't go to. And black folks wouldn't if they had the money. But it seems to me we are assuming um a continuation of the rather peculiar um, system of uh, support for education which exists in this country and in which this country is quite unique and I think rather backward, uh, that is the use of local um, real estate taxes. Um, wouldn't that problem be solved by having a centralized um, system of um, support for education, um, which... Uh, this is what metropolitan desegregation is about. We're speaking yeah. about the sharing of, sharing of resources along with desegregation. See, keep in mind that boundaries that separate cities are not magically determined, they're politically determined. <laughs> and uh, uh, communities uh, that have political uh, lines separating them uh, share power, they share all sorts of resources, mm -hmm. and we're trying to extend that resource to include human beings, simply put. Uh, Mr. Morgan, I, I'm troubled by this. Are you really suggesting to me that you would expect me to willingly obey a law, comply with a law, which told me that I should send my children to a school other than the neighborhood school simply because my last name was Williams? understand fully that if we lived in a society as a minority where black folks had the power and they had the money and we were put off in some ghetto school, do you really believe that those black folks would put a sufficient amount of money into your and my school to make sure that our kids got an equal education? I don't happen to believe that. Or to revert, excuse me, go ahead Charlie. I don't happen to believe that and I secondly believe that we ought to get around in this country to starting to do some things under the equality clauses of the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, that whole thrust of law to make sure that when people are charged with crimes, they get an equal representation, to make sure that the rich folks don't get out of jail, to make sure that the rich folks don't get out of sending their kids to the poor folks' schools, and that the poor folks get the advantages of the rich folks so that they all do get a start in this country, and they don't wind up sitting here in this nice hotel room because our parents had a little something going for them, or we might have been a little bit smarter than somebody else. <laughs> uh, let me just say, I, I fully agree with Professor Patterson's point that you can do a, a, a good deal with money, even though some of my Harvard colleagues have <laughs> argued otherwise, even non-Harvard colleagues. Uh, and, but also, it is not the case on the whole, on the whole, that we are dealing with, uh, that the schools that black people go to are very poorly funded compared to the schools that white people go to. That's not the case. Uh, in, uh, it's not the case in Boston, it's not the case in New York, it's not the case in... Now, it is also true that even though they're not more poorly funded, and we have studies on that, that their needs are greater. I think we have to put more money into them. I quite agree on that. But let's not, uh, let's not uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, live under the illusion that the average black in this country has uh, less spent on his schooling 
than the average white. It comes out data the same. I, you oh, know, I, I'm oh, amazed oh. by the kind of data oh. that's being accumulated at Harvard University. That's just a, uh, that's not the case. Most certainly, can you, would you dare argue that the quality of education and money spent in com suburban communities surrounding Detroit, surrounding Gary, Indiana, the surrounding Atlanta, base. Georgia, the whole tax base is, the Supreme Court is commensurate? On that. Well, you have the rich property. property. Have better Would you schools? measure up food evidence food? on Sir. that? Not all well, suburbs are rich suburbs. There are a lot of industrial suburbs around those cities. Central cities, on the whole, uh, are, are, are spending easily at the national average or above it, and central cities are the place where most blacks live. <laughs> It's and and there. This is this is these are simple. I mean, we we don't want to get into the statistics, yeah. but you yeah, cannot right. show the average expenditure for per black in this country is less than that per white. You can I, show I, that the average expenditure yeah. for poor people in this country is less than the average expenditure for the children of rich people. That it is so show. tremendously clear. And the bulk of the no black, question about and that. the black, black, black community is poor. But you and cannot show yeah. that. Which because the whole bulk of them live in central cities with relatively <laughs> high expenditures in education. An allocation of resources alone is not adequate to ensure that all young people, black, white, uh, irrespective of social class, do receive, and, uh, receive what I define as quality education. And again, it's twofold. One, the development of adequate skills related to the area of academic achievement. And secondly, uh, the uh, elimination or the modification and the building uh, of negative attitudes and the building of positive attitudes towards race, race and social class. And even if funds were equally allocated across racial groups and racial isolation and racial <laughs> identity was maintained in a society that's race conscious, quality education will never get off the ground because power, first of all, I accept the assumption that Individuals who will power will not, are not going to reallocate that power and distribute it even, evenly across the board. Gulf Oil is not going to do it. Standard Oil is not going to do it. And the American Public School Corporation is not going to do it. Secondly, I hold to the position that as long as this nation is race and class conscious, separate but equal will not stand the test of a fair distribution of funds economically in this country. This concludes another public policy forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. I want to say thank you very much for your participation, in particular for the participation of this very distinguished panel. This roundtable discussion on the impact of school busing has brought you the opinions of four experts in the field. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many differing viewpoints in the hope that by so doing, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036.